Okay, uh, welcome to this uh, episode of uh, Short Watercolours, Watercolour Shorts. I'm Howard Jones, and this week I'll be working from a photograph. Um, in this series I'll be jumping between working from photographs, working from imagination, a combination of the two on some occasions by where we will um, take a photograph and uh, deliberately move away from the photograph to create something a little more inventive. But I thought I'd open up the um, I thought I'd open the books here with this photo of it's a uh, castle in Scotland, rather beautiful building. It sort of greets you. It's a scene that greets you on your way into the uh, Isle of Mull. And um, I chose it because it has some fantastic dynamics, not just for its geometric shapes, um, but there's a good range of contrasting tones, tonal values, and uh, a good range of, of um, complementary colours, um, at least complementary colours that I see. So, um, so we're working from a photograph, there's a couple of checkpoints. Um, the darks in this are not too bad, they're not too sort of flat. Um, in a lot of photographs that can be a problem. But I can see quite a bit of detail in this rock face in the dark area and in the shadows of the castle itself. Now when it comes to the colours, um, these greens might be a bit bright. Um, and there's a, a lovely sort of warm chocolatey purple if you like um, colour down here just in the foreground in the rocks um, so that's going to be my colour combination we're looking at playing greens off purples and a few warm colours that we'll get from I'll go through my colours in a moment um, so um, the composition is Okay, I'm I'm happy with this composition. I remember taking the photograph at the time. It was actually on a on a f small ferry, and um, and I had in mind, you know, the composition that this vertical, the most, the highest part of the castle itself, falls on the right hand vertical of the grid. So some good strength in the horizontals, with that being my focal point territory because it has this strong vertical. So let's make a start. So imagining that my grid is here. Really mostly just concerned with this upper right, sorry, the vertical right hand grid line. Um, scale wise, um, I'll guess some of these positions for the, for the moment and then look at correcting them if they're too My far out. concern is always um, a good composition and a good design and that often calls for a change in the scale of things anyway so just roughing it out there seems to be so even that measurement between there and there this measurement here is estimated it's a it's a reasonably close guess because you know having already established the width of this main tower up here I can more easily now guess that measurement there and then there seems to be a small turret type shape here there are other details which we will include some um, depending on how important I feel those details are. Small chimneys in places here. There's a really, if, I, if I'm to copy the f f uh, shadows that are in the photo, they're going to look something like that. So there's a light patch here cast shadow off those little chimneys, there's a cast shadow off this tower here in the foreground and there's a bit of water down here. Now I'm not sure that the water is going to um, offer anything to this uh, painting. Um, 
we'll see. I think that's one of those areas that I like to leave to as, a, as an option towards the end of the painting because you do need something horizontal down in the foreground. It'll give it a nice sort of sense of, of base, of weight, of balance. But whether that should be a stretch of water or we just keep to the lovely textural rocks that are at the edge of the water might be more in keeping. We'll see. As I say, um, we don't have to make that decision now. I've made all the most important decisions already, and, and that is um, my shapes, my position, which was already here. So, so I think we'll make a start. We'll get some paint down. We'll get a wash down on here now. And I'll refer to the photo from time to time. But as I go through the photo, I will rely less and less on the... Um, on the photo as, as, as my reference. So my brushes are a large mop, uh, a one inch flat, a size four round with a good point, and a rigger brush, and the pencil which you've just seen me using, which I think was a 3B. So let's start off with um, a wash of, I'm using cerulean blue here. very weak wash of cerulean blue don't really want this to be this painting to be about the sky um, so just get this first wash down pretty weak just cut roughly around my my castle not being too careful because there'll be a need for some of that blue in most areas of this painting. So even across stretches of the land like this, I'm dry brushing it. Even though I stopped back there where the edge of that distant mountain is, I will just skim the belly of this brush into other areas like this. And that brings some cohesion throughout from top to bottom. Then into the water, if this is to be water, we'll put some reflected blue in there as I say, we've still got that option for that to be water or not by the end of it. Probably will be water, as it's a nice balance to bring the mount, I suppose, to, to bring reflection of the sky um, down here, lower down in, in the foreground territory. Now, I'm going to pick up some um, cadmium yellow. And I'll show you what I do here. That's my existing blue that I just, you just saw me picking up. The cadmium yellow... I'm working on a plate so it's easier for you to see how I'm um, mixing my colours. And then we'll run this green straight into this grassy area up here. Doesn't matter if it overlaps into the dark territory. And there's the green down here. Now I think that could do with yellow, uh, more yellow in it. So. There's a, there's a lovely bit of sun hitting these um, these greens. So it's just blocking in the main shapes, really. And uh, there's some green appearing up here as the um, ground itself encroaches the walls of the castle. Over in this back area, it's quite warm. But it's a long way off, so you can't go too uh, can't go too warm. I'm picking up a very weak, watery little bit of um, raw sienna here, <coughs> and I'll just place that over there. This is all still wet, so I'm really effectively working wet into wet here. But I'm just being careful if, if you can see that. I'll try not to make too much contact with this, the edge of the sky that I've left. So that you know this this mountainside doesn't leach, doesn't drift into the sky too much. If it does drift into the lower sky, I sometimes encourage it to do so. If it does drift into that lower sky, it's no it's no bad thing because it'll give a sense of the lower sky uh, warming up, being being slightly warmer than the sky at the top here. The sky at the top is always a that bit usually a bit darker, a bit cooler, um, and the skies on days like this as you move down towards the land mass um, will just warm up and get paler. 
Just making good, just, just dotting out those trees with the same mix in there for the moment. I will drag, belly brush some of this green into the rocks, even though they're going to be mostly purple. And I'll speed, just speed dry this now. So I'll go back to the large brush. And this time, I'll just clean off that the wrong colour. This is a cold colour. We've been using cold colours. So now I, I need, because I need to warm things up, I need to get rid of anything that's going to stop me from doing that. I need to get rid of the cold colours that I've been using. I want some warmth. So, clean the brush mostly. Um, and I'm picking up, this is just raw sienna. It's fairly weak. Can always add to this. There's the raw sienna, and I'll just pop that over the main part of the castle here. So I'm not being overly careful as to where uh, where this colour stops and starts. It's pushed up mostly to the edges, but not all the way up. You don't want to be painting neat edges. But we have, as I say, the same sort of colours down here. It'll be that little bit stronger down here because it's closer to us, this foreground. And so I'll introduce a little bit of burnt sienna as well as the raw sienna. So now I've now got a little bit of burnt sienna with raw sienna. It'll just warm that up even further. But the, the delivery is just very random. It's certainly not a blocked in shape, you know, it's uh, there's a, a, a paint delivered here, paint delivered just there, perhaps a little bit, bit of this warmth just in a, one area of the castle there, something like that. Now while it's still wet, um, providing I just take off some of it with a tissue, I'll go in with some other colours. So here's my trusty tissue. Put the brush down for a moment. So I'll just pick off any little puddles, being careful not to take the paint off completely. This will just give the stone stone face of the walls of the of this building some texture. And likewise, I'll do the same down here. But look at how random the uh, shapes of the warm colour is against the shoreline there. So alizarin crimson is a is a cool red and makes a much much more beautiful um, a purple colour. And my blue, because we know that red and blue make purple, my blue will be ultramarine blue. And I'm just waiting for that colour to change so that the blue dominates slightly. There we are. So I'll just drop some purples in randomly for the moment. I might need to help those along with a smaller brush. So there's my little size four or five round. So I've delivered the paint. I just want to distribute it a little bit more naturally. I don't want too much brush work. This, this, Pushing this around forever will destroy your painting. So just be very choosy as to where you want, actually want this um, this purple. All you're really doing, you're looking to sort of create a texture. Not a shape, a texture. We'll go in something like that. And as I say, I can deliver some to this area down here. So I pick up the big brush with the purple mix in it again. And deliver this mostly to the... It's, I suppose going to be the water's edge when we get there. Again, off the point of the brush, not the belly of the brush on this occasion. I'm using the point of the brush. And I've put that brush down. And again, I can use the smaller brush to manipulate and control exactly how I want that delivery of purple paint to look. It's, it's to sort of emulate, copy what's what's actually in the photo here. So 
through. It's pretty smooth, you know. I'm running this little brush along on its belly like this because I can see soft transitions of this colour. Now, before this gets a chance to go uh, to, to, to dry off, I'm going to pick up a new mix, and that new mix that is going to be so I'll clean that off for a moment. That new mix is going to be ultramarine blue, which is the blue we just made uh, uh, used, sorry, and this time a bit of burnt sienna. So I'm mixing the cold blue, the uh, ultramarine blue, with a very warm burnt sienna, and that gives me a, a nice dark, a good quality dark. And I'm just going to use this to dot the small brush, to dot the dark recessed edges. You know, along this edge here, there are areas where the rock is turned away from the light. So we would expect to find our dark little shapes along along that edge there. Now there is a tidal line on these sort of shorelines. Um, you can sort of see it, it's sort of like a dark a dark purple, even darker than the, the purple that's currently on my painting. So you can do that. I'm not sure it's not totally necessary that you copy the photo, you copy the detail to that degree. But if you do want to do that I suggest we do that when this, when this is a bit drier, when this has gone dry. So now let's look at the really dark areas uh, in this rocky, rugged bit of ground. And I'm using the belly of the brush, but I'm using the same colours more or less. Let's pick up more. I think we'll go with the addition of some alizarin crimson. So there's three colours there, ultramarine blue, burnt sienna and a little alizarin crimson. Because I can see that these sort of shapes are that sort of dark purpley shadowy type colour. And you can see I hope what I'm doing here, that there's no, no use of the point of the brush like this. I'm not using the point of the brush. If I want to later I can, but to get this main shape in I'm just using the belly of the brush with, with the brush loaded pretty full. Um, I'm getting as much into this brush, little brush each time as I can. But by using the belly of the brush I get a much more interesting texture. Do, I get the sense that there's a, a strata in this rock, so I'm not going all over the place in all directions. I'm actually pulling down, sometimes in a gentle diagonal like this, making good the edge, that's quite important, that where this edge meets the grass, the green. Now that's where I'm just using the point of the brush a little, or I'm angling the brush a little bit more, so I'm working towards the point of the brush. Just to get a good edge. Just to get a nice cleanish edge down there. So you, if you probably notice, I, I used quite a bit of paint in that. Um, you don't be mean with the paint. Mix more than you think you need. I've just had to mi mix a little bit more myself then. I'll just bring in a little bit more of that. Sometimes bringing in a little bit of raw sienna back in because that's what the colour that's in the castle itself. There. I think we'll use this colour for our conifer tree. We'll just scrub back and forth, giving that the edge, the required shape. Giving the edge of that tree the required shape. A little too wet, so I'll just dry it off with off, on my bit of cardboard over there. A 
Okay, now we can, um, I'd, I'd quite like to run a fingernail sometimes through these wet, well, damp areas of paint, just to add that sense of rock face. Some places are wet enough still for me to do it, others have gone too dry and I've missed the opportunity, but that's enough, I think. So now I'm going to turn my attention to um, the castle, but I'm going to use the same mix, more or less. Just refill my mix, ultramarine blue, burnt sienna, alizarin crimson, perhaps a little bit of raw sienna. And I could use a little bit of, um, that was too much, I just picked up too much then. Uh, indigo, just be a little bit careful not to use that area. And I'll just pick that at the edge, to just put a little bit of burnt sienna at the edge there. So I see areas such as, I'm just looking up at the photo, getting my ideas, anything that hangs over, like at the, uh, such as this edge at the top of the wall there, we would expect there to be a sort of shadow somewhere to follow. There's no way you can see exactly, you know, at this distance what's going on up there. So you do what you think you can see. You paint what you think you can see. Looking up at the photo and noticing that there are some, a few extra little inferences, if you like, of harder surfaces, harder rock face, just around here, which is very useful because it's in a good position, it's in the focal point territory. And because this is the focal point territory, we need to um, almost exaggerate the darker marks and the harder edges, because that's what catches the eye. Okay, so I think we'll speed dry this and we'll finish the painting. Okay, so what we're dealing with here to finish the painting is now the application of the shadows, um, which will further increase the dynamics in the painting. So um, my mix will be, I'm going to change brush, I'm going to turn to the one inch flat for this, for my shadows. Um, I've already got some indigo in here, as so I put quite a bit in there earlier, but I'll add a little bit of the... Um, ultramarine blue to this. So ultramarine blue, notice I'm making quite a lot, I'm picking up a lot of paint. This is why you have to use tube paints. Uh, you'd be there all day if you were trying to uh, create a large volume uh, of paint like this, if you had those pans, the dry pans. It's a nice big puddle of shadow mix so that on its own would be too cold so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little bit of alizarin crimson not too much as it's a very strong pigment um, but what I'm going to do now is add a little bit of light red to this which will give the purple shadow a slightly more natural look to it sort of makes it a little more neutral. Now then, I don't know whether this is too strong or whether it's not strong enough, so you, you never really can tell until it goes on the paper. Um, ideally you want your shadow colour to be transparent. If it's not transparent, it's too dark, then it won't look like a shadow. It must reveal what the shadow is falling on. In this case, you know, a wall, um, and other areas. Um, on, on the other hand, if it's too weak, you will um, <coughs> if it's too weak, uh, it won't it will not look like a shadow. So that what I do is I always have a tissue in my hand and I make a, a test. I, I say, well, I'll try it here. And I think 
that looks to be about right for me. And I'm just more or less copying what I can see in the photo. There's a leading edge of light just where my finger is, but we'll just hint upon something slightly dark in the space between. Um, yeah, because if if it's not right, if if you don't get that shadow right, and you think, oh, well, it's too weak or it's too dark, don't carry on regardless and think, well, it, it'll dry out and it'll look fine. It's best just to stop and readjust your mix so that you get it right. Just go that extra half a mile, that extra inch, and uh, make the effort to get it right. It's worth it in the end. You'll be glad you t made the effort just to stop down tools. Don't worry because the paint's not going to dry out that quickly. You can down tools and if it's too strong add a bit more water. If it's not strong enough um, you can of course um, add more paint. So I'm looking at now how these very sculptural these these shapes this is the reason why I use the flat brush it gives me a, a far more geometric shape which is what I would expect to find uh, that's what I would expect my shadows to look like when they fall on these facets of rock face now there's an area that's of rock face that um, seems to get uh, quite a bit of the sunshine so we'll try to leave that out about here where my finger is just pick up some more shadow colour here and run this shadow back here again, something like this. A bit more light hitting about here, but the rest of that then seems to be mostly in shadow, which is quite convenient for us. Like that. Now there's more shadow up here in, in the castle. So just reload the brush perhaps once more and look at this. There's a slight, there is an angle to the shadow. There seems to be this turret thing about here where my finger is. And we know it's a turret because it's the shadow that tells us that there's something there. We can't it's not that easy to see the, th the the object that's casting the shadow, but you can see the shadow that is being cast by the object. Uh, it's it's great. I love I love those sort of clues. The fact that it's not made obvious for us, we we have to read into them. So um, I'm leaving that for a moment like that. I'm going to down, put that flat brush down. And I'm just going to soften some areas now because there's a lot, at this distance, the, the edges of those shadows might be a little softer than they would be if they were close, if the whole thing was closer to us. So what I do is I take a clean round brush like this and just pick at the odd edge just to soften them out. And one more thing I'll do in those shadows before they get a chance to dry out, I'll pick up some just a small amount of burnt sienna which is that lovely warm colour of course and we'll say that um, that gets a little bit of warmth in places just drop, you have to do this while the shadow is still wa uh, still wet whatever you do, if that shadow has gone dry don't do what I'm doing now um, wait for it to dry completely and then you'll have to spritz it with a little uh, water atomizer to do this but if you work, if you get used to working quite swiftly, and this is why I do encourage people to work, um, you know, comfortably quickly, um, then you'll always be able to have this option to put your warms into your shadows in, in the wet and wet technique, which is always the best, I feel. I, I think it's always the best time to, to add your add your little bits of warmth. Is why do I put the warmth in there in the shadows? Simply because um, flat areas can look very flat if they're just one temperature, if they're just a, a dark cold colour, um, or they're a dark warm colour. If they were all, you know, if it was dominantly um, dark warm, I'd be putting in a cool colour now, not a warm colour. So there we are. I think we can sort of safely say that is more or less the 
the job done there. And I'll just run some of the shadow through the foreground. Sort of... By doing this, it, it, as I say, it adds just a little bit of um, cohesion. You know, you're, you're pulling things together from one part of the painting to the other. Just soften off with, this, with the soft brush in some places here. But there'll be more hard edges down here, so don't soften off too much, too many of these edges. The, uh, this area is much closer to us in terms of proximity, so you will expect, you will find more hard edges down here. Something like that. And then I'm just picking up a little bit of yellow there, just cadmium yellow into that purple mix. And I can sort of say, well, dotted around here. There are some individual rocks, stones, boulders. The odd line just running through the, the, the foreground over the grassy areas like this. That's just a brush with a small amount of paint and a, a bit of water in it. And there you have it. Um, you know, you can just put in a few, uh, now that we've decided this is, water down here we'll just add a couple of ripples like this quite a calm day so we're not going to see uh, a rough water that we, this should be adequate that little bit of movement indicated on the water there there we are So we started with the photo. Um, I've made a lot more of the light and dark as you can see. The photo doesn't have the same dynamic um, in terms of light on the castle and dark on the castle. So I always feel as though, you know, photos are a reference, a source of re reference only. Um, we really should be using them to um for our own imagination so um you know even when we use photos i strongly urge you to do two things really consider carefully study the composition as to whether it is suitable um whether it's in terms of aesthetics it's in balance and um you know look at the lights and darks is there you know could you create more dynamics if you if you if you wanted to um, to make it a better painting, so it's a reference. It gives you ideas, um, but you should always look to be doing something different to the photo. That brings us to the end of this watercolor short lesson. Um, if you're enjoying my videos, then please uh, remember to subscribe, and if you want immediate notification as to when I upload fresh videos. And lessons just click on the uh, bell icon um, that will ensure that you receive notification as and when these new ones go up on my channel um, if you want to participate in my live zoom tutorials uh, just pop over to my website they can be booked at one month at a time there's no block bookings um, you could just do a, a just a, a taster one month if you like um, but all the details are over on my website uh, links to which are uh, below this video um, thanks for watching and hope to see you in the future